Good afternoon, everyone. This is Therese Brown at the Association of Catholic Publishers. I am pleased to welcome to our session today Ken Brooks from Treadwell Media and David Marlin from Metacomet, one of our ACP associate members, to talk about the very important issue of cybersecurity. A few notes before we begin. Uh, I am going to hand over control of everything to Ken and David, and they will guide you through this session. But you do have a few means with which to communicate with the speakers as well as me. So let me point your attention to that. You can ask questions and answers using the Q&A feature on your screen. Feel free to use it at any time. I will be monitoring that during the session, and we will handle any questions at the end. And if you have something important or something you need to let us know, something regarding the content or something just regarding the technology of what's happening in front of you, um, please use the chat and contact me directly, and I will see if I can solve that problem as quickly as possible. So without further ado, I am going to let Ken and David take over. Ken and David, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to everybody about a, uh, a topic that's very important and certainly uh, of great interest, um, and we'll get into a, 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 in a sh shortly a, a little more reason about why it is of so much interest. So uh, my name is Ken Brooks. Um, I've held uh, just a variety of leadership roles in trade and educational publishing companies. Um, I've dealt with cybersecurity preparation and response, both internally and at vendors. Um, as an advisor, I've counseled companies on how to be prepared for cybersecurity incidents. I've talked with CIOs and CISOs, chief information security officers, at many of the largest publishing and printing companies about these topics. Through this experience, I've developed a strategic perspective on what you should be looking for and questions you should be asking from your IT personnel. There's a huge amount of information out there, but as an executive, the question is how should you be approaching it when it's only one thing out of many that you must be paying attention to? David? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, so my name is David Marlin. I founded Metacomet Systems back in 2000. Uh, I've been in the publishing industry since 1998. I started as a technology consultant, and I had the good fortune of working for uh, hundreds of publishers over the years, from uh, you know the, the the biggies, Penguin Random House, down to small independents with just a couple dozen titles. Um, and so while Ken brings the strategic view of security, uh, I, I'm happy to bring a, a tactical perspective today. Uh, I oversaw Metacomet's rigorous security certification over the last uh, year and implemented the specific measures that, that Ken will be discussing. I also bring the perspective of having worked with hundreds of publishers of all sizes. So what will we cover today? Today we're going to answer four questions. After this, you'll have an initial framework to think about your security. So the four questions are, what is the problem around security? Why should you care? What protections are available? And what can you practically do? So as we go through the presentation, I encourage you to please put any questions you have into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and, um, and, and we'll take those up either during the presentation or at the end. So why don't we begin? What is the problem? So um, ransomware, that is one of the biggest current cybersecurity issues. Approximately 37% of global organizations in 2021 reported being a victim of ransomware attacks. Uh, the FBI is showing a 62% year-over-year increase, and since 2020, there have been more than 130 different ransomware strains detected, and that problem is accelerating. When you further consider that not all the victims of ransomware attacks report that they've been attacked, the statistics are even scarier. And in some of the articles that I've been reading recently, it appears that small and medium-sized businesses are being increasingly victimized by ransomware since They'll have money to pay the ransom, but often they're not as well protected as the big companies. 
Um, and ransomware is really only just one facet of the cybersecurity problem. Uh, data breaches are another. Many of the largest companies in the world have been hit with data breaches. Um, and this is alarming for many reasons, one of which is that individuals often reuse passwords across accounts. So if one of your customers, one of your suppliers or employees has been compromised in one of these breaches, chances are they're using a similar password for your applications. One client that I was talking to found the names of all of their senior executives on a list of individuals whose passwords had been compromised from the attacks. Now, this really affects all segments of our industry. Um, in a brief search of my notes um, and online sources, I found a number of companies in our industry that have been victims of ransomware attacks. They range from printers to publishers to wholesalers and content and technology service providers. Generally, this is something that's been kept quiet, but many of the executives, uh, executives of these companies have uh, spoken about some of the challenges that they faced and how difficult what, difficult it was to recover. Now, some of these companies are quite large, but they don't have to be. We'll return to this theme in a moment. Uh, in a moment, getting hit by one of these attacks can really be just a drive-by crime of opportunity. You don't have to be targeted to be hit. Oh, and on this list, um, I left off Indigo, which uh, as of like a month or so ago was still having difficulty recovering from a ransomware attack. Um, maybe this is a good time for David to talk about why Metacomet cared about the problem. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So I follow both general business and publishing industry news closely, as does Ken. And, um, you know, security breaches are in the news all the time. And every time I would read about one of these breaches, as, as the you know, CEO of Metacomet, I would ask myself, is this something that I should be worried about? And if it is, what should we be doing about it? Uh, you know, and I would often wonder, are we doing right by our customers, employees, and, and ourselves by continuing to ignore it, which, which really had been kind of our default process um, prior to, to last year? I would also wonder, you know, does my cyber insurance and my business insurance cover this? Don't, won't they just handle this for me if this is a problem? I, I had no idea what it took to secure an organization. There's a lot of broad stroke concepts out there if you look at how to secure your organization online, but there's little available about practically implementing them. And it's really hard to understand which of these uh, brought, you know, concepts we should really be paying attention to, which of these security issues we should really be paying attention to. So what was the problem for, uh, for Metacomet? Um, you know, and, and, and really it boils down to, we knew there was a lot that we should be doing, but we didn't know exactly what it was. So why should, why, why is it, you know, Ken, Ken talked earlier about, about the issues, you know, so, some of the, the, the statistics, but why should, why is this something that we should all be caring about? So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ken. Yeah, let me jump in here. Um, as I mentioned, this is often a drive-by crime of opportunity. Um, this is some actual information from a client. Um, the client was a medium-sized printer who had experienced a ransomware attack a good number of years ago, and in response had, had implemented fairly stringent cybersecurity measures. One of these measures was a comprehensive scanning of emails. Um, on the right here, you can see a report of what's been going on with their emails over a period of time. And while I'll talk more about this coming up, emails are a major source of phishing attacks. And as you can see in this case, the number of dangerous emails far exceeded the number of clean messages that were coming in. Now, all of these emails weren't necessarily phishing attacks, but at minimum, they represented distractions to the employees from doing, doing their daily work. Another popular attack is a drive-by ping on your network ports. At the bottom, I have a screenshot of one of these reports showing requests over time. If you think about this, this is like a burglar just walking around houses 
trying doorknobs, but this is high volume and it's automated. Once an opportunity is found, then that burglar passes the opportunity on to the next level to see how it can be exploited. So let's uh, let's transition back to David. Great, thanks, Ken. So, so why did we care? Why did Metacomet care? What led us to make the call to spend virtually all of 2022 focused on security? So, first was our our business and and our people. Um, dozens of people depend on us at Metacomet for our livelihood, and we have a responsibility to them to run Metacomet well. Obviously, if something substantial were to happen to us, it puts their livelihoods at risk. Our customers, almost every publisher pays royalties. And however they do it, whether it's an Excel or a dedicated royalty system, there's lots of sensitive data involved. So when, you know, I'm, I, I, my expertise is in royalties. And so when it comes to royalties, that data includes all the contract details that you have with your authors, all of your sales and revenue information, all of your author contact information, all of the payment information to your authors. So that's all at risk. Um, and, and also royalties are mission critical for publishers and they need a company that they can trust. A royalty system outage would be devastating. You know, a lot of our customers wait till pretty much the day the royalties are due before sending them out. And if on that day we were to get hacked or that week, they wouldn't be able to send them out and they, are, and they would be at risk of missing their obligations. Very closely related to that is our reputation. Um, and there's a couple aspects to this. One is we want to create a positive impression um, and, and, and be sure that uh, you know, we're letting everybody know that we're taking these security issues seriously. And of course, I don't want us to show up on that list that Ken just uh, presented, because obviously that creates some uh, brand damage. Um, another reason that we, we cared was our stress levels and personally just the uncertainty. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, every time I would read one of those articles, I, I couldn't help but ask myself, are we at risk? Are we doing the right things to prevent ourselves from being hacked and from becoming a, a victim of the, of these multitudes of of cyber crimes and and the threat just seems to be increasing constantly um and i i know most businesses share some if not all of these concerns now is is this realistic are are these real issues so to address that i want to tell you a story of something that actually happened to to me um so uh, a few years ago uh just a little while before covid um my co and i were uh we took a big trip to europe to visit all our european customers and we were taking a train from amsterdam in the netherlands to eindhoven um, an, another city in the netherlands to visit a customer and um, and, and it's about, I think if I recall correctly, it was about an hour and a half train ride. And so, so our CEO and I were sitting on the train working, you know, they had built in, they built in Wi-Fi right into the train. Um, so we were like, this is great. We can get some work done. Um, and so we were on the Wi-Fi using the Wi-Fi. Um, about a month later, uh, our um, controller uh, got an email from me. It was actually from my email account saying, please wire $50,000 to this account. Um, and it gave a legitimate reason why she should do that. She responded to me and said, is this legit? And I apparently responded to her and said, yes, absolutely. Send that money ASAP. Um, well, fortunately, uh, she never did send that money. And what happened was during that trip on the train, we isolated it to that train ride, we were subjected to what's called a man in the middle attack. So someone had intercepted our communications with our email through the Wi-Fi because we weren't using a, a, what's called a VPN. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so someone access, was able to access our credentials. They were able to log into our email system. We used Microsoft Office 365. Um, 
and, and they were able to actually send emails directly from my account. And they had set up a filter so that any emails from my controller that mentioned the word wire transfer were automatically forwarded to them, to the hackers. So they could then log back in if she wrote back and respond from my account. So it, it was coming from me as far as our controller was concerned and, um, and, and tell her, yeah, it's all legit. So this is this is a real life story, um, and 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 these kind of things, you know, these these uh, um, this these vulnerabilities are are all over the place. Um, so so that's just an example of what can happen when you're not vigilant. Fortunately, due to controls that we and our bank had in place, nothing, you know, we came yay close to sending that fifty thousand dollars, but fortunately, we we never did. So. That brings up the question now of the, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna be answering four questions. So, that, so the next question is, what can be done? What can you do as, as, a, uh, as a business and, and as, a, as an individual to protect yourself? And so with that, I will hand it back to Ken. Uh, thank you. Hey, uh, just cu uh, cur curious now. So do you use a VPN um, in these kinds of situations now? Yeah, so because of that, well, uh, really because of that, but now also because we're a, a, a secure organization, everyone who is not using Wi-Fi um, in, in our office or in their secure home offices has to use a VPN. And what the VPN does is it encrypts everything coming out of your computer and coming back into your computer when you're on the Wi-Fi. So in this, so so what that does is that protects. Um, so if someone does intercept it, it's all it's all gibberish to them. Um, so it, it provides, uh, I, and it's a very important thing for people to use when they're using public Wi-Fi is to access a VPN. And uh, getting a, a VPN is really simple. We we subscribe to a service uh, called NordVPN. I think it's like a hundred dollars a year um, per person. And any anytime I was just on the plane doing emails last Friday, I always use a VPN now when I'm on a public Wi-Fi. Uh, that's good advice. Yeah, good advice. I do the I do the same thing, except in a, when I'm in a known uh, a, a known situation or using my phone as the uh, my uh, my connection. Um, so what we've done here is we've we've uh, put together a, a a bunch of words into a word cloud. Um, security has many, many dimensions. The question is, is how does anybody in the security field not know what to do? Or how do they know what to do? It's really just not practical. It's just too overwhelming. The vocabulary alone here is terrifying. Um, in the words of Hillary Clinton, it really takes a village, including the CIO, uh, the chief information security officer, security specialists, attorneys, insurance companies, and so on. But most of us don't have all these things, and that's where security frameworks come in. So these frameworks provide guidance on how to set yourself up for a secure environment and go into all the considerations that you might overlook when you're dealing with the word salad of potential issues and solutions. I've listed a few of them here. Um, there is a booming business in frameworks and cybersecurity training. Um, David will get into the specifics of what Metacomet did to get SOC 2 certified, but let me briefly talk to you about how the AICPA organizes its SOC 2 framework. SOC 2 focuses on five areas, infrastructure, organization, product, procedures, data, and privacy. And within each area, there's just a plethora of detail. Um, we'll skip over the detail here and just get back to Metacomet's adventure in implementing SOC 2, uh, but we'll we'll talk more about this um, in the next uh, in the next few minutes. Um, yeah, great. So um, just before I get into this, I just want to give everybody a reminder: if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the question section, and we'll make sure to address them uh, at the end or or as we go. So. So practically, as Ken mentioned, we decided to follow the SOC 2 uh, framework and, and it requires companies to have a series of well-defined enforceable controls. 
We chose SOC 2 because it's pretty much the standard security framework here in North America. In other parts of the world, you'll see ISO 27001 is common, and, and that's also highly regarded. So in order to become SOC 2 compliant, we had to implement 19 policies which cover those five dimensions that, that Ken just mentioned. Each policy in turn goes into great detail about what we are to do um, and, and what we will do if, if issues arise. So what, what, we, what we need to be doing to prevent issues and what we will do if, if issues arrive. Um, here are a few of the big ones uh, that are on this slide. So you have information security, access control, physical security, you need to have an incident response plan. You need to have a code of conduct. You have you have to have security around your hiring and dismissal practices. Um, I'll also take this moment to mention. So a lot of times you'll see talk, uh, SOC two. There, there's there's two main types. There's type one and type two. Um, type one is confirms that you've you've identified the controls you want to have in place, but that's pretty much the the limit of type one. Type two confirms that you're actually following those controls over a period of time. To do everything is really quite intense practically and, and perhaps beyond the capabilities of many companies. There are dozens, so among those 19 security policies, they specify dozens of controls that need to be continuously monitored. We here at Metacomet have 80, exactly 80 security controls that we have to continuously follow and monitor. And that, again, as, we, as I've said, is, is really just overwhelming. So that brings up the question of what can you practically do? So what do you do to get started? Um, I'd say if you're highly interconnected with customers and suppliers, you can use a framework and go for certification. That's what Metacomet did. Um, you'll be able to point to your certification to demonstrate to customers and others that you're on top of things. You can likely use this for brand enhancement if your customers are sensitive to security issues, and most of them will be even if they aren't now. At the same time, it's complex, it's expensive in terms of both dollars and resources, it requires considerable ongoing effort. Um, the other approach is to follow best practices recommendations from leading organizations and experts. Now, this might be more practical for smaller companies and perhaps for non-service providers. It's certainly less expensive, but at the same time, it requires a level of accountability that you've considered all the angles and have plugged the holes. And there are a few of these that are particularly hard to plug if you don't have something or someone watching every move. Some quick examples of this. Um, do your people know not to put foreign USBs in their machines? So if they find something, uh, a standard thing to do is to use that as a Trojan horse. The employee sticks it in the machine to see what's on it. And before you know it, your entire network is, is infected. Do they know how to recognize phishing attacks? Um, I've been through many, many different security trainings. And every now and then, one of these gets passed. But Generally, there are a lot of signs that uh, uh, that uh, the email is not what it's supposed to be, uh, but they're getting very, very good at, at fooling people that, that even uh, have gone through all of this training. Um, do you have any out-of-date computers or software around that are running software that you just can't get around to upgrading or replacing? I can't tell you the number of publishers that I've talked to that have oh, this accounting or forecasting system or whatever it is, it was invented by this guy, you know, 15 years ago, it's running on a Windows 2000 computer under a desk somewhere. Um, those uh, particular environments are particularly susceptible to, uh, to infection. All of the hacks are known in those, uh, in those systems and the software just isn't being upgraded or isn't being uh, maintained anymore. So. It's very dangerous. And of course, there is the, all, are all of your ports closed? This has been the source of many of those attacks that uh, I, I mentioned earlier on. So with either of these options, you really wanna consider a couple of approaches. Um, 
Either way that you go, you're going to need help, and you'll likely need both consultants and a security platform. If you're a large enough organization, you may well be able to afford a chief information security officer and staff to manage security. As a smaller organization, though, a part-time service provider to work with, um, your IT uh, lead or your CIO, if you have one, may be sufficient. Either way, it's good to have a security platform that can help you monitor your compliance. You can use the platform to test most of the commonly open doors for attackers to enter, and the good providers are constantly up updating their capabilities as new threats are identified. What this does is it automates most of the process, gives you reminders and monitoring. It makes auditing cheap, cheaper and easier. It hooks into other systems like payroll and development, and it kind of does the worrying for you. Um, as we were preparing for this, situ this presentation, David and I were discussing the pricing of these platforms. You'll have more to say about this, but when you think about it, a 10 to $20,000 expense per year is a very small price to pay for what would happen if you're out of business for a few weeks or a month. Here are some of the gotchas to watch out for, though. Um, when you're implementing the, the platforms, you really need to keep an eye on unforeseen costs, including uh, cost of development for integration, software changes, and up, upgrades. Um, also, there will be a cost associated with rectifying all the problems that it identifies. You can't just ignore what it's finding and keep putting it off. Now, uh, it will require resources to do this. Uh, these platforms usually aren't nearly as cookie cutter as they might uh, lead you to believe. They need an owner. Um, that's someone within the business to monitor and ensure compliance. And they may end up messing up some of the things you do as a normal part of your business. Uh, David can talk about cookie blockers and marketing data as an example of this. Let's take a look at how uh, David addressed these issues. Yeah, so um, so we use a platform uh, called Vanta, an automated security platform, because it really just didn't make sense for us to have full-time security operations people. We, we weren't a big enough organization to be able to justify that expense. And um, so we decided to go with an automation platform. And, and here's an example of how it works. So um, our HR system, so, so this, this screen that we're looking at gives us real time, uh, just simple view of what our security compliance is. Um, so let's just say we hired somebody. So we work with a, a pretty standard HR system called Gusto. There's a lot of other HR systems out there. Um, and Vanta, this platform, and as, as most of these automated platforms do, integrates with our HR system. So Vanta knows the moment that we hire a new person. And um, so we, we then have a certain number of days based on our SOC 2 compliance requirements to ensure that we've met all the security requirements associated with hiring new people. But until we do hit that compliance, our, our score temporarily drops, as you can see here. Um, and, and it's up to our security officer to ensure that we're back to full compliance within the timeframes outlined in our policy. So here you can pretty specifically see, so we, as soon as we hire this person, we drop to 95% compliance. As I mentioned earlier, we have 80 security controls that, that this platform, and, and I gotta say, there are a lot of gotchas with these platforms as Ken mentioned, but I love this platform, it is really awesome. Um, so here are the 80 controls that we have in place, and this is constantly monitoring those 80 controls. I could never do this. We could never do this without an automated security platform. Um, and uh, this is telling us, well, we only have 76 of those controls um, in compliance right now. Um, and we'll, we're also GDPR compliant, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about that um, in, in a moment. So, uh, so, so what do we have to do to ensure that we are compliant? Um, so uh, based on our policies that we implement, and these are pretty standard policies if you're following one of these security protocols that, that Ken mentioned. Um, every new employee we hire has to go through a background check to make sure they don't have a criminal record. Um, every new employee uh, has to read 
and agree to abide by those 19 security policies that I had um, mentioned earlier that we have. Um, every new employee has to go through one of those policies is, is security training. Um, and every new employee has to go through our st standard security training, which this platform provides. So they'll actually do watch some videos on the platform um, and the platform will validate that they've complied with and have gone through this security training. And so now once they've gone through this training, um, and, and we've done our background checks and, and they've uh, agreed to our security policies, we're back up to 100% compliance. And, and thanks to this automation, our security officer, um, which could really be with one of these platforms, anybody in your organization who's willing to take on this responsibility, they only need to spend a few hours a month to manage this and keep us uh, secure. So once you're up and running with these platforms, it's actually quite easy to maintain your security. Um, anytime we come out of compliance, this platform just automatically sends her an email and she, she can see exactly what we need to do to be to come into compliance. And, and pretty much the two main things, the two main reasons we get out of compliance are we hire somebody or every quarter there's a few standard things that we're supposed to do. So we're supposed to uh, make sure all our software is up to date. We're supposed to make sure that every single cloud service that we have, only people who are authorized to use that have accounts on there, things like that. Um, and, and if we haven't done that, the platform lets us know and reminds us that we have to do that. Um, another practical thing that you can do is to, to know your vendors. So any company you work with, for instance, your royalty provider, whatever risk your vendors have, you kind of just automatically incur that risk yourself. So if you're working with a, a company that, you know, that's not secure for, for any of your tools, um, that presents risk to your organization. So essentially, you know, all of, you don't necessarily need all of your contractors and providers to be totally secure um, because they don't necessarily have access to things that can uh, make you vulnerable. So you have to really assess the risk level of each contractor and company you do business with and where appropriate, ensure that they have their required security procedures in place. So, you know, maybe your marketing firm doesn't need to be uh, certified secure, but any company that you host your data on certainly does. Um, or in our case, you, you want your royalty system to be secure. So especially for the most high-risk vendors, the easiest way to know that they are secure is through a certification which, as I mentioned earlier, typically in North America is SOC 2 Type 2. Um, so I want to take a, a brief, really quick detour into GDPR. Um, so in addition to our SOC 2 compliance, we made the decision to become GDPR compliant. And the good news is if you're SOC 2 compliant, you're pretty much 75% of the way to being GDPR compliant. So GDPR is the uh, General Data Protection Reporting. I forget what the R stands for, but it basically, it's a European law. So if you're doing business in Europe, you're actually theoretically required to have this compliance. Um, and it just ensures data privacy. It ensures that, that everybody you work with, you're keeping their data private and secure and you're giving them the opportunity to opt out of anything and to and to uh to request that they purge that you purge your system of their data um uh this this type of data compliance is is coming to the u.s so right now already california has this thing called the ccpa the california consumer privacy act so if your business is doing more than 25 million dollars in business and, um, and and you're doing business in California, there's, there's one or two other criteria. Really, you're supposed to be CCPA compliant, which if you are GDPR compliant, you, you pretty much are um, CCPA compliant. The, the, you know, many of you might be below that, that $25 million threshold uh, of annual business. But the important thing to realize is, is based on my recent research, there's 15 other states that are in the process of considering and implementing data privacy 
requirements. So just something to keep in mind that this is coming. And again, if you're if you follow one of these security frameworks, you'll be well on your way to being data privacy secure too. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about cyber insurance. So both Ken and I agree that cyber insurance is good, if not critical, to have. And it is very helpful in becoming secure because one very important aspect of being a secure organization and one requirement of being SOC 2 Type 2 certified is that you've done uh, incident response planning. That, that actually the term they use is tabletop planning for incident response. So basically you're given a list of like 50 different scenarios. And so our, our leadership team meets and we have to, we have to specify what we're going to do if an incident if if we encounter an incident if if we're if we're hacked or broken into in some way um and one of the great things about cyber insurance is they basically provide this in, incident response so we were able to it makes it makes having an incident response plan much much easier because basically for like 45 of those 50 situations we could just say call our insurance company call our insurance company call our insurance company and because we're paying for this service they'll automatically well they, they, they'll they'll handle um it's not automatic but as soon as we let them know they'll take over our, our security response and they'll they'll go into our systems they'll help figure out what happened they'll help figure out what we need to do and they'll manage the communication with all our customers and partners um, so even you know so one other thing about cyber insurance is even the most secure companies can still be hacked basically what you're doing by following these best practices is is making sure you're doing everything you reasonably can to be secure but it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to be hacked in some way so so most general business insurance may not cover things such as ransomware attacks especially with the depth that you're going to want or need and they almost certainly don't have any kind of incident response if you are hacked. So um, it's, it, it is important to get to have cyber insurance to protect yourself against these situations. So now, while we never want to experience a ransomware attack, if we do, our insurance company is going to compensate us both for the, the cost of dealing with it and for the business impl implications of, of having been hacked. Um, another interesting aside about cyber insurance, and I just we just recently went through the process of switching our cyber insurance, and so I did a lot of shopping around. I managed that process for us here at Metacomet. And one interesting thing I learned that cyber insurance covers that general business insurance generally doesn't cover is liability from digital media that we may be involved in, like a webinar such as this. So if I say something totally stupid and somebody decides to sue us, our cyber insurance policy actually covers that, whereas our general business uh, insurance, and I didn't even realize this, wouldn't cover us for that. So there are some other uh, interesting and odd things that, that cyber insurance will protect you against. Hey, uh, David. Yes. Uh, so when you were out shopping for, uh, for cyber insurance, um, I've been hearing that because of the surge in attacks that the insurance providers are scaling back their coverage and they're increasing deductibles. Did you see any of that? Um, I didn't see I didn't see scaling back or decreasing, but what I did see was a pretty substantial price <laughs> increase. So okay. um, which probably compensates for that difference. Yeah, it basically our, our cyber insurance costs went up 50 percent from uh 2022 to 2023 so it's getting much more expensive there's a lot of plans out there it turns out and and so i think if you have a good agent you really need to work with an agent on this who, who really will take the time to get to know your business you can get a, a good uh, a, a good plan um so um so so now we're going to just talk about uh some um you know uh conclusions from you know we'll, we'll go over some conclusions from uh this discussion and and before i get into this again just a reminder please feel free to put any questions that you have in the question part of GoToWebinar, and we'll be sure to get to those so so ken and i put together a list of some uh next steps you can take one of the first is to get cyber insurance because not only does it help with ransomware which is one of the most common types of uh cyber security issues 
but it, it also gives you that incident response. So you can just rest easy. I don't know if any of you have ever had to use some of your insurance policies, but one of the great things, we, we had a situation several years ago and I was really stressed out, but our insurance company, fortunately we have a great agent, our insurance company called us up and said, the reason you paid for this is so that you don't have to stress. We're gonna deal with it for you. And it's just such a relief to know that the, these professionals who are experts at dealing with this will, will handle it for you. Um, you'll also want, I love the analogy that Ken used, it's kind of like so, someone knocking, you know, with the ports, it's like someone knocking at, or, or going to every door in the neighborhood and seeing if you left your door unlocked. So you'll, you'll want to start using per, have, having periodic scanning and, and of your ports and, and voluntary penetration testing. Uh, some, hiring someone to do the penetra penetration testing can be a little expensive, and I'll go into the costs in just a minute. Um, but you'll get really valuable insights uh, from what they discover, especially if you have any custom systems that are open up to the world. So early last year as part of our security certification, we did pen testing, as it's often called, on our royalty platform, on our author portal, and on our sales aggregator tools. Those are our most common, those are our three main tools, and they're all open to the world. Anybody can lock, can not log in, but can go visit those sites. Um, fortunately, they didn't find any vulnerable, uh, I'm sorry, critical vulnerabilities, but they did find five issues that were classified as high risk. And so that was a little bit concerning, but that's why you do these pen testings. We had thought that our system was secure. We have really top-notch developers. We thought we'd been paying attention to security, but these, you know, these pen testers who are really just kind of professional hackers, um, uh, they found these these five vulnerabilities, and so um, once we found them, we quickly fixed them. It took, and this is Ken mentioned earlier that you know th this is one of those hidden costs because if you go through the process of uh, becoming secure, you will find issues and you're going to have to address them. Um, so you know we had to have our developers kind of put other stuff aside for a month or two while we fix these. Um, and then included included in our in our pen testing plan, our penetration testing plan, they reassessed uh, us. They they tried to hack in again, and and they confirmed that we closed all the security gaps that they had identified. Um, if it's not already clear, as Ken mentioned earlier, make sure that you've implemented email filtering and moved all collaboration tools to the cloud as much as you can. So think about Google. Office 365, Amazon AWS, using Dropbox to store your data. As much as possible, one of the easiest things you can do to become secure is to move your, as much as possible to the cloud. Uh, again, make sure they're all SOC 2, Type 2, or better certified for security, but all those big ones are, and for the most part, and so you can rest pretty comfortably that, that they're following all the best practices, so you don't necessarily have to worry about that yourself. That's one of the easiest and most cost-effective things that we did, because we, we got rid of all our internal servers. We have um, you know, pretty much nothing that we're storing uh, directly on our, ser on our servers um, anymore. It's all in the cloud, and so you know, like we use AWS, and, and so, it just ensures that everything is secure. Um, implementing a technology policy, um, doing employee training, and support that with simulated attacks. So there's there's some great companies out there um, that will actually test your people, your your staff for phishing. Uh, they'll send them fake phishing emails um, and uh, and and see if anybody responds to them, and if they do respond to them, then then they will provide training to those people um, uh, to make sure that they they understand what it is about those those phishing emails that they missed. Um, as Ken mentioned earlier, make sure all your equipment and applications are up to date and patched, and also make sure you have good backups and make sure that you've tested they work. Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of times I've heard of companies that had backups, but uh, that found out after it was too late that the backups weren't working. Um, they'd been halted for some reason. A in my case, years ago, I, I had a client whose server had crashed. So it wasn't a security issue, but their server had crashed and their hard drive was totally destroyed. And despite running nightly backups, they, they were set up with nightly backups. They were totally confident they were covered. 
they discovered that nothing, nothing was actually getting backed up. Somewhere along the way, the backup would just start reporting as running, but nothing was actually getting backed up. Um, and that's surprisingly common. And that's yet another reason to move as much as possible to the cloud. Um, it, just, it just gives you uh, a, a high degree of confidence that everything's backed up um, properly. So I also want to, um, you know, I mentioned that I would cover some of the costs. Hey, David, um, before yes. before you jump before you jump to the cost, I want to tell a, a, a story about the simulated attacks. So uh, this one client um, had a, a process of doing the simulated attacks, and they were built. They built a leaderboard to see which departments were most susceptible to falling for phishing attacks. And uh, I don't know whether you'd consider it surprising or not, but uh, the sales group ended up <laughs> at the bottom of the leaderboard uh, for that security consciousness. So, uh, oh, just that's a, a, that's a, yeah, that's yeah. a great that's a great story, Ken. It's a great it's a great idea for for inspiring people to become you know more secure. I I, I love that. Um, so I, I just want to just in case you guys are are you know, hopefully you are considering implementing some of the things that Ken and I spoke about, just to give you a sense. So this is what we pay. Um, now, obviously it's gonna depend on what type of organization you are um, and how big you are, um, but we pay about $8,000 a year for cyber insurance. This is above and beyond our general business insurance. Um, the security automation platform, I think this is pretty standard, regardless of how big your company is for some of these, uh, platforms we pay about twelve thousand dollars a year for that Vanta platform, um, which is just again it it makes that process of ensuring that we're compliant uh, so much easier because otherwise it would just be too overwhelming. Managing those eighty controls, there's no way we could afford to have someone on staff to do that. So the security platform does that for us. Um, the pen testing, it can range. Ours costs us about $3,000. I've seen prices of $5,000. I think it depends what you need, but that's about what you're looking at to have someone uh, do penetration testing. And then if you want to become certified, um, it costs us about $10,000 a year for an accounting firm to, to, to an independent accounting firm to verify that we're following all 19 policies and that we have uh, all 80 controls are being monitored and managed. Um, and a, uh, I've seen costs well into the 20s, $40,000 for these audits. But the great, one other great thing about using one of these security automation platforms is it makes it so much quicker and easier for the auditors to, uh, to, to, to check on you that the price goes way down for a security audit. So, um, uh, so, so these are these are some of the costs that we incur, just to give you a general sense. Um, and as Ken mentioned earlier, you know, compare this to the cost of being out of business for a month. Um, that would be devastating to us, as I'm sure it would be to pretty much any company. Um, so, I look at this as a sort of a required cost of doing business. Um, so, I'll I'll hand it back to Ken now. Uh, we've put together a few resources uh, to that that you might find valuable. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump to that. Um, so the uh, um, first off on that on that point about is this too expensive? Um, you, you wouldn't hesitate uh, buying business insurance. You don't really hesitate in spending money to keep your um, systems infrastructure up to date. Um, this, unfortunately, is just another cost of doing business that uh, will continue to uh, to be there. Um, and it's going to be required, particularly if you work with like public schools or other um, uh, institutions that uh, have protected data that they that they're quite concerned about. Um, so back on the resources, um, Dave and I put this list together. Um, one of the first things to do is, is to get cybersecurity insurance. Um, it's, it, it will help with the ransomware exposure, uh, but you'll also get the uh, incident response and periodic evaluation of your capabilities, of your uh, security initiatives. 
Um, th these uh, organizations, I think, are going to be um, useful to you um, with specific hands-on things to do. So the, the GCA Cybersecurity Toolkit for Small Businesses gives you like specific things to do. NIST has the exact same kind of approach. Uh, the FBI cybersecurity um, area is more general information. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting to read and they keep statistics on like the number of attacks and things like that. But uh, you're not gonna get as much detailed recommendations as you would from the GCA or NIST. Um, then I've listed a few other um, companies here. Know Before is just a great supplier of uh, security training for employees. They do the simulated attacks um, as well. Uh, CrowdStrike is known as a, a, a very, um, uh, it's expensive, but it's a, a, a good way to prevent uh, denial of service attacks and remote uh, monitoring of all of your, uh, your endpoints. And then there are the security platforms like uh, Vanta and Tugboat. Yeah. No, David, do you have anything further to uh, to add on this? No, I think this is a great list. There's a lot of security platforms out there. These are just a couple of the lower priced ones. Um, there, you, you some of these security platforms, which are probably more appropriate for larger organizations, can can get pretty expensive. But I I did a lot of shopping around, and um, I decided on Vanta, and I'm really happy with that choice. And again, as Ken mentioned earlier, they're going to quote you. So a couple things, make sure you negotiate with them. So they might say it's $15,000, ask them for a discount. Um, and uh, um, and also re realize they're, they're going to, you know, they're salespeople. They're, they're all, you know, most of these companies are venture backed and they're under a lot of pressure to sell. So their salespeople will be like, oh yeah, it's only going to take you 10 hours of effort. It probably took us, I would say, more like 100 hours of effort. Over the course of a year, we spread it out over the course of a year, maybe maybe 150 hours of effort to get everything compliant because we found a bunch of issues that we had to fix. Um, and uh, so, so, so just, just be aware that, that, that there are, you know, take, take it with a grain of salt what they sell you, but we're really happy with the Vanta uh, platform. Um, so at this point, you know, if anybody has any questions or would like to talk about any of this, we're happy to discuss that with you. Uh, we've also put our emails up here if you want to reach out to us directly. Um, you know, Ken specializes in a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have as well. So um, please reach out. And, it, and at this point, I think we'll uh, see if anybody has any questions for us. Thank you, David and Ken. It's been a wonderful and wonderfully informative presentation. Especially appreciated both the broader issue conversation as well as the practical kind of stories of how you at Medicon had dealt with some of the same things that others are facing. Um, we don't have any questions. Actually, you answered the questions as we went through, so that was great. Um, for those of you who are here, this as I mentioned earlier, this session is being recorded, so we will post it at the webinar page at the ACP website. And uh, a link to the webinar will go out to those who registered but didn't attend, as well as those of you who are here. Um, I will also be featuring it in this uh, upcoming newsletter for our members, so they will have another chance to take advantage of the great information that you shared with us. With that, uh, any last comments, Ken or David? Otherwise, I think we're pretty much done. Very good. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to everyone. Yes, thank you. And thank you. It's been extremely informative. Um, those of you who are, are members and are listening on, we will have continue with our webinar series throughout the rest of the year. So please pay attention to your newsletter and uh, visit the website for more information as those webinars appear on our calendar. Thank you very much. And good day to all of you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.